and welcome back to the virtual classroom. I'm your host, Dr. Olmstead, and welcome back to part B of our lecture regarding the age of conservatism. Now we left off with talking about the, the passage and the implementation and the problematic nature of the crime bill. Again, this is just one of many policies that on the surface seem like maybe possibly a good idea, but that we should have seen the warning signs coming. Likewise, one of Clinton's major economic policies was the North American Free Trade Agreement, known as NAFTA. Now, let's be very clear. Technically speaking, this was not a Clinton bill or a Clinton program or policy agreement. It was negotiated under George H.W. Bush that would that he had negotiated with Canada and Mexico that would essentially reduce tariffs to almost nothing, in which theoretically was going to open up markets in Canada and Mexico to American industry. Now, again, theoretically, this sounded like, good. hey, there are neighbors, we should cooperate better and create a more North American economy. On the other hand, Texas oil billionaire Ross Perot, who had ran for president in both 1992 and 96, had warned that NAFTA would create a giant sucking sound. His words. The sound of American jobs being drawn to the cheap labor of Mexico. But when he became president, Bill Clinton pushed the agreement through Congress over the objection of more pro-labor Democrats. And that giant sucking sound is exactly what it did. NAFTA would increase the pace of de-industrialization de of America in the United States. And these neoliberal trade policies will hit Latinx and Black workers particularly hard. Take Yolanda Navarra of Watsonville, California. She's a cannery worker who observed, quote, we lost our work here. So the, these giant companies can go and exploit those of us who remained in Mexico, unquote. NAFTA had created a destructive impact on small farms in Mexico as well. Texas Fair Trade Coalition organizer Bob Cash noted, quote, what NAFTA actually did in Mexico was to throw two million farm families off their farms. Many of them forced to relocate to the U.S.-Mexican border. And when they couldn't find work there, come into the United States to find work just to feed their families, unquote. What NAFTA created was a new phenomenon on the U.S.-Mexican border known as maquiladoras. These maquiladoras would be the result of this NAFTA trade policy. You see, following the economic downturn of the 1980s, Mexico was forced to follow the <clears throat> recommendations of the International Monetary Fund and World Bank if they wanted to be able to secure new loans to help stabilize their country. These um, recommendations would include giving up the nationalization of some major industries, as well as opening their borders to for foreign companies. This neoliberal system evolved and took hold as foreign companies came in and set up their factories and assembling plants in Mexico to exploit the cheap labor of the country. This was done primarily along the U.S.-Mexican border, as you see on the top left map. <clears throat> This system that began in the late 80s would only accelerate with the passage of NAFTA and cause nearly all the focus to shift to the northern border of Mexico because free trade caused farmers in the interior to be unable to compete, causing many of them to move into the crowded Maquiladora border cities. Overall, between 1994 and 2000, Employment in these sweatshops, these maquiladoras, 
rose 113% from 600,000 workers to over 1.3 million workers. This growth made Miquiladoras the second most important source of wealth in Mexico, paying exploited labor wages. But remember, these maquiladoras are predominantly U.S. operations or subsidiaries. And the worst hit were the workers. As one said, quote, the maquiladora sector thrives upon exceeding low wages and minimal labor standards. This did not come from just anywhere. When NAFTA was in deliberation, workers unions and labor unions made two different predictions. Number one, jobs would be exported to Mexico. And number two, NAFTA would create the potential for hazardous working conditions, unquote. That's exactly what happened. It would be all to the detriment of workers, working class Americans in the United States, working class trabajadores in Mexico. What happens is the towns that were created by the maquiladoras were substandard. As one writer wrote, quote, many maquiladoras work, many maquiladora workers would live in communities neighboring or in the vicinity of the plants. The basic infrastructure of these communities, roads, transportation, sanitation, schools, and so on, was often substandard or inadequate. For example, one worker's house was described as being made of shipping pallets in cardboard. Los trabajadores do not make enough money needed to help themselves because of the low wages they are paid. And as a result, the communities suffer. Unquote. Working conditions in one of the most active maquiladora areas along the U.S. Mexican border were described as rem reminiscent of 19th century U.S. sweatshops, <clears throat> the Gilded Age. Occupational health concerns include inadequate lighting, poor ventilation, excessive noise, lack of hygiene, lack of security measures, exposure to toxic and dangerous substances. The facilities were characterized as a public health threat. They even subjected women to random pregnancy tests, and if positive, they were fired. Let me show you a short video that includes interviews from some of the workers. Yo me llamo Carmen Durán. Soy empleada de maquiladora. Yo he trabajado en una maquiladora. Yo tenía 13 años cuando llegué aquí. Con... Y estuve, o sea, estaba sola en zona. Y aquí ya me quedé. En los años 60, escuchamos por primera vez la palabra maquiladora. La maquila venía a cambiar todo porque ofrecían salarios mejores que en otras partes del país. Eso es lo que veníamos buscando los migrantes a esta tierra. Empresas de otros países vienen a nuestro país por los incentivos fiscales y por la mano de obra barata. a trabajar ahí. Al principio me, empezaron, me empezó a salir sangre por la nariz. Y este, ahí lo que me empecé a enfermar más fue de los riñones, por motivo de que pues no te dejan tomar agua, no te dejan ir al baño. Eh, nos decían los supervisores, los jefes, el componente este que nosotros estábamos fabricando, el componente de Playback se iba a Indonesia porque la mano de obra ya era más barata. 
lo único que querían ellos era pagar menos y, y ganar más. Mi nombre es María de Lobón de Rafael Aguirre, tengo 29 años. Tengo la cámara prendida y voy a empezar con un poco de contarles de mi vida. Miren, aquí yo vivo en la colonia Chilpancingo. Esta es una toma de donde yo vivo. Bueno, ustedes son dos personas. Y se va a pasar un transporte de aquí de la colonia y por el río. Preguntas son de las chivas por el puente, que ellas también las utilizan. Ahí van los trabajadores. Lo de eso son operadores. Las latas tienen el color de la oh. lata tiene un rango. Okay. Entonces cuando te ven con la bata, saben que quién es el que es dentro de la, de la empresa, si eres jefe de grupo, supervisor. Decían que hacíamos mejor el trabajo por nuestras manos chiquitas y ágiles y por ser una fuerza laboral supuestamente dócil y barata. Dentro de la globalización, la mujer trabajadora de la maquila entra como una especie de mercancía. Y esta mercancía no es productiva, sino es atractiva para esta globalización porque ya ella se empieza a defender o empieza a, a buscar optativas de derechos o aquí, la buscan en otra parte. Para mí como mujer de la maquila, para mí es preocupante porque somos objeto, objeto de, de trabajo, o sea, objeto de labor. Once again, these conditions that they're describing, the words that they're using, that they are commodities, that they can't have bathroom breaks or have access to water because that would make them go to the bathroom, give them bladder problems. The living conditions, the working conditions, these are all the exact same things that we discussed back in 19th century US history with the Gilded Age, before the Progressive Era and the New Deal helped place regulations on businesses. And that's exactly what NAFTA did. It took US companies, allowed them to move their operations to Mexico. And once in Mexico, there, weren't the, there were no unions of the UAW to support them. So if you're a worker for General Motors or Ford or Chrysler, you put the plant in Mexico, no UAW support. Wages are decreased. There are no safety standards, you know, that are built in to protect the workers. Because Mexico does not have those same policies. And the result is not only the loss of U.S. jobs, but the exploitation of Mexican workers. And as I said, it puts a large huge number of you know mexicans on the border between us and mexico and when things go bad at these maquiladoras you got to feed your family somehow and or there are still many us companies that will recruit from across the border and then use their undocumented status to as leverage to control them it's all being manipulated now to be clear Despite these major issues, the crime bill and NAFTA, huge blunders, ultimately the economy is going to soar into the late 1990s. The 1990s, for the most part, were a very prosperous decade. But this new economy is being fueled by technology, especially the rise of personal computers, the development of the internet, the stock market is going to soar. And by the late, late 1990s, by 1998, unemployment was down to 4.3%, the lowest in 30 years. The world was becoming interconnected at, in every way, but it came at a cost. You see, 
while the unemployment rate dropped, while the, the economy would greatly improve, American manufacturing was gutted in what is called now the Rust Belt, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, these former bastions of industry. They would suffer greatly as companies outsourced their production to Mexico and overseas. Kind of important to understand this when you start to understand the 2016 election. In addition, as working class Anglos saw their jobs being downsized, outsourced, de-unionized over the course of the 1990s, the face of America was also changing. Now, since the 1965 Immigration Act had repealed discriminatory immigration quotas, the United States had become much more diverse. During the 80s and 90s, the U.S. population grew by 20%, some 50 million people. Almost 30% of Americans now claimed non-white ancestry, African, Asian, Hispanic, or American Indian. So 30% of Americans now claim non-European white ancestry. African Americans now represented 13% of the population, Hispanics 11%. Asians 4% and Native Americans 1%. There had been a surge of both legal and undocumented immigration. And I remember being told in school, oh, within 20 years, Anglo whites are gonna be the minority in the country. Again, those were fear tactics. And the thing is that fear works. This surge in immigration, this new demographic reporting meant that there would be a huge anti-immigrant hysteria that would help fuel the modern conservative Republican political agenda. Take California, for example. This new nativism took hold. In 1994, California voters approved Proposition 187, which denied the state's estimated some 4 million undocumented immigrants access to public schools, non-emergency health care, and other social services. They're denying access to education, so no one even has a chance. In 1996, California would then pass Proposition 209, which ended affirmative action in hiring, in contracting, and college admission. The measure passed with 54% of the state popular vote. Governor Pete Wilson of California lauded this as an opportunity to create the nation, in his words, first colorblind society. In other words, we won't take your color of your skin into account for college admissions. The result? In just the following year, college admissions at the University of California system dropped by 80% if you were African-American, 50% for Latinos. So colorblind society, no, no. It became more white once again, more Anglo. In 1998, California voters ended bilingual education. This new nativism has remained a part of American society ever since. Also in 1998, Mexican-American Democratic candidate Loretta Sanchez would defeat eight-term Re Republican Representative Robert Dornan for the Orange County representative seat. Now, once again, Loretta Sanchez, you see her on the screen on the bottom left, she would pull off an upset here defeating an eight-term incumbent Republican representative, Robert Dornan, for the Orange County represent, representative seat. It was a tightly contested contest, but Sanchez won. What did Dornan do? Rather than concede that he lost to a Latina. Instead, he blamed or he disputed the ballot results 
claiming that bad ballots cast by people who are not even American citizens, who are undocumented immigrants, stole the election from him, despite no evidence. Sound familiar? Again, these are all things that have been building for decades that we're still facing today. Now, the new millennium came and it brought some new challenges. NAFTA continued, still continues today. The United States went through eight years of the Great Recession. And most recently, continuing a two-year global pandemic. There was another major nativist pushback following against immigrants following the terrorist attack of 9-11. The thing is, though, this recession, this heightened nativism made any immigration reform or compromise difficult at best, political suicide at worst. In 2008, the nation celebrated the election of the first black president. But the reaction to that, just two years later in 2010 midterm elections, the voters elected far right leaning conservative politicians, creating a virtual stalemate in government. Now, I'm not gonna spend a long time on the 21st century, but I do want to highlight a few things of importance besides the terrorist attack, besides Barack Obama. The economic policies of Ronald Reagan since the 1980s has been to cut taxes on the wealthy in large corporations. Reagan did it. George H.W. Bush did it. George W. Bush did it. And so did Donald Trump. You can see on the screen. And of course, who these tax cuts, so this is the, the Trump tax cut. The major beneficiaries here are the top 1% of Americans, the already wealthy. The result of these tax cuts was not only budget deficits, cuts to entitlement programs and social welfare programs, but also the increased racial wealth gap, the gap between rich and poor, largely based on race. Look at this chart on the screen. Look at the top one for a minute. The median or middle net worth for whites is $171,000. Compared to just 17,600 for African Americans, 21,000 for Hispanics. Really? And again, this is being thrown off thanks to the mega wealthy, obviously, who are getting these tax breaks. Look at the bottom chart about assets. So this means things that you own or control that involve your net worth, right? So if you own a home, that, in, that is counted as part of your net worth. But look at home ownership. 73% of Anglos own a home compared to just 45 and 46% for Blacks and Hispanics. And it gets worse when you look at equity. Home value minus debts. Whites have an equity of nearly 216,000 compared with just 94,000 and 130,000 for Blacks and Hispanics. What that means is even if a Black or Brown person owns a home, they owe more money on it, which means if they want to get a home equity loan to start a business or to make improvements, they can't get that compared to the Anglo counterparts. And then look at the retirement in stocks, which also contribute to your retirement. I mean, vehicle ownership is pretty high across the board. Look at retirement accounts. 60% of Anglos have a retirement account compared to half of that number for Blacks and Hispanics have retirement accounts. Publicly traded stocks, 
which can contribute to your wealth in your retirement. 61% of Anglos have stocks. Again, half that number for Blacks and Hispanics. There's a huge wealth gap in this country that on the one hand, yes, it's a large wealth gap that's been existing in the Gilded Age, the 1920s, and now again in the 21st century. But when you break it down by race, it's bad. Now, aside from the economic policy, let's look at the impact of immigration and its effects. With an even more Republican Congress, Obama's second term was punctuated by executive actions, including executive action known as the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. In other words, Obama could not get anything passed in regards to immigration reform. They tried. There was actually a bipartisan group that was trying to do, actually in part led by Republican Marco Rubio, trying to get some kind of comprehensive immigration reform that would include, hopefully, a path to citizenship for undocumented immigrants, <clears throat> a la what Reagan did. But after the 2010 midterm elections with more of the far right leaning, more radical Republicans coming into Congress, it was a no-go. And so during Obama's second term, he would turn to executive action. And on June 15, 2012, the Secretary of Homeland Security would announce that certain people who had come to the United States as children. So they weren't born in the United States, they were not citizens. But they were undocumented, but they were brought here as children. And they have to meet several guidelines. They may request for consideration of deferred action for a period of two years subject to renewal. They would also be <clears throat> offered a chance for work authorization. They could work legally with a work visa in the United States. This deferred action is the use of prosecutorial, prosecutorial sorry, discretion to defer deportation action against an individual for a certain amount of time. Note though that deferred action is not lawful status. It just means that you're still undocumented. We could still deport you but we're not going to for a certain number of time as long as you keep meeting these requirements. So in short, if you were under 30 with a clean record other than being undocumented, you may be eligible. Now for many undocumented immigrants, this was a godsend. It's a chance to not have to worry about that someone rear-ended you one day, not your fault. Someone plowed into your car, you're in a car accident and the police show up and they have to provide papers that show you're not, you're not documented. That's a problem. That's a fear. But on the other standpoint, it's a fearful thing. Your name is now on a list. They know where you live. And what happens if another president or administration comes in that doesn't like DACA? And of course, President Trump is kept in the news, has been trying to get rid of it. Now, thankfully, as of this recording, it is still in effect. And Biden has campaigned on trying to make it permanent, enabling a pathway to citizenship that would include voting rights. But as this recording, we're still waiting. And so DACA became this way because the argument was, if you were someone who's five years old when your parent entered the country as an undocumented immigrant, or you were brought here on a legal visa or other type of you know, legal entry, and then you overstayed the terms of your visa or your card. Then if you're a young child, did you really have a choice in that matter? If you're five, six, seven years old and your parent says, hey, we're staying here. Come on, we're staying here. Are, did you have a choice in that matter? No, you do what your parents said. And you're someone now who's been here for 20 years and grown up in the United States and gone to you know, public schools and maybe even gone to college occasionally. You have jobs here, you have family, you have friends, you've been part of the economy, you've been contributing to social security and other taxes you've been paying, but yet you'll never reap the benefits of. And you're gonna be deported to some country that you don't even know. 
Yeah, you're from there technically. That's just cruel, unusual punishment. But again, we're still waiting. Now, the thing is, though, in response to all of this, in response to the recession, in response to native spheres, and yes, even in response to DACA, these newer, more far-right leaning politicians that came after 2010 have raised the old immigrant, anti-immigrant, old anti-Hispanic talking points as a way to drum up support from the, their base of vote voters, playing on the old fears that immigrants steal jobs. They don't. Threatening to overrun the country. They won't. And replace true white Americans. Now, I hope you all wrote that this is not new. These are the same rehashed arguments that we've talked about all semester. This is a rehash of the Southern strategy designed to use fear to appeal to the base values of a minority segment of the nation. What is new, however, is the use of social media to get increased frequency of messages to more people compared with the slower methods of the early 20th century. The results of this, though, accelerated after 2015, thanks to the candidacy of Donald Trump. It has been the demonization of people of Spanish-speaking descent. Look at it on the screen right now. Donald Trump, Mexico's court system, corrupt. I want nothing to do with Mexico other than build an impenetrable wall and stop them from ripping off the United States. Oh, and of course, make Mexico pay for it, right? Top right, Pat Peasy. I put a sign in my driveway. All Mexicans must show green card to get trick or treat. Really? Or of course, Governor Christy Noem of South Dakota. South Dakota won't be taking any illegal immigrants that the Biden administration wants to relocate. My message to illegal immigrants is call me when you're American. How very Christian values of you. How very Statue of Liberty values of you, even if you're tired, you're poor, you're huddled masses yearning to be free. And of course, during the presidency of Donald Trump, he said a number of things, disparaging things about Latinos, even before starting his election, stoking those immigrant fears, referring to Mexicans as rapists and murderers, saying that when they send their immigrants, they aren't sending their best. Again, he's not technically calling all Mexicans rapists and murderers. He's referring to a smaller subset of immigrants that he's blamed as being crime-ridden, disease-ridden. And as he says, I assume some are good people. But the insinuation here, what people hear when they hear this, is that immigrants from Mexico and later Central America are bringing crime with them that these are gang members, MS-13, that are coming to rape and kill and murder Anglos in the, in the United States. He also stoked those old immigrant fears while highlighting the migrant caravans that trekked through Mexico from Central America, attempting to seek asylum in the United States, consistent with our laws. He highlighted this to stoke fears during the 2016 and 2018 election cycles. But the story of migrant caravans does not start in 2016 or 2018 or even 2020. It starts back in the early 1900s. Then it ramps up after the 1980s under President Reagan. You remember dollar diplomacy? You see, from the 1910s onward, the United States continually had reached into Central America and South America to prop up and dispose of regimes that were not friendly to U.S. business interests. Now, this was often done in the name of the Cold War after World War II to prevent communism from entering the Americas like it had in Cuba and Venezuela. But in places like Central America, it was, often, it was done just as often to protect private, private business interests. After decades of rule, 
many Central American nations became more socialist in that they wanted to oust foreign influence. American businessmen who dominated the large industries in their nations. They want to get, they want to get rid of those American businessmen. To do this, these nations would have to nationalize those important industries. In order to get rid of these American businessmen running the industries in their countries, they had to get rid of the American businessmen. To do so, they had to nationalize the businesses, which took money away from the U.S. businessmen. So to prevent this, the multiple U.S. presidents would send in operations to expel governments that tried to do this, including in places like Nicaragua, Guatemala, Honduras. This includes the 1980s with the Reagan's Iran-Contra affair. So the brief overview of this. See, in Nicaragua, the U.S. has supported a family of dictators known as the Samosas that had been in rule from 1936 all the way to 1979, known as a brutal dictatorship that the U.S. supported because they were friendly to U.S. business interests. Now, in 1979, the Sardinistas, a populist movement of socialists, would overthrow the Samosas and turn Nicaragua into a socialist state. They nationalized industry. They unionized all industry. They instituted campaigns to improve literacy and health care. But the United States had business interests in Nicaragua. In nationalization of these industries angered the Reagan administration. After taking office in 1981, Reagan began funding the Contras, a group of counter-revolutionaries, former Samosa guards and other elements that were based out of Honduras. The U.S. would send money, guns, and training to these Contras fighting against the legitimate government. Reagan even permitted the CIA to put mines in Nicaragua's harbor. Put simply, Reagan wanted the Sardinistas out of power. Upset by this, Congress passed a series of laws that forbade Reagan from funding the Contras. So Reagan, well, his national security advisor, John Poindexter, made a new plan. In 1985, Lebanon held seven American hostages that were held by a group with Lebanon ties, or with Iranian ties. So in 1985, Lebanon had taken hostage seven Americans with, by a group with Iranian ties. So the new plan by Reagan and Poindexter was to sell arms to Iran in exchange for help with getting the hostages out. And then take that money, some of that money, and divert it to the, con the Contras fighting in Nicaragua. This Iran-Contra affair stem from a desire to control unfriendly governments. Now, why am I saying all this, this history here? Well, this means now that there's been more than a century of intervention, political and economic, into Central America, based not on the national interests of Central American countries, but instead on U.S. business and political interests that had long destabilized the region. And those refugee-seeking caravans that Trump railed against were a direct result of the century-long policy. Though they were just trekking through Mexico, many mainstream Anglo-Americans did not distinguish between them and Mexicans. Take the situation when Trump would cut funding to three Central American nations. So the situation is, Trump said, we're going to cut funding, foreign aid, from the United States to three Central American co countries. Because, and we won't give it back to them, this funding, until they can control their people. Stop them from leaving in these migrant caravans. But look how the news station, the conservative news, reported this. Fox News. Look at the banner on the bottom. Trump cuts aid to three Mexican countries. Are you kidding me? Three Mexican countries? I'm pretty sure there's only one Mexico. 
How about three Central American countries? And the thing is, again, this, this is a very concerted effort, all of this, to paint people of color from whether it's Mexico or Central America or South America or the Caribbean as lower class deviants who are going to bring crime and murder and rape to the United States and overrun the United States Anglo population. <clears throat> look at this. Look at this criminal nature, supposedly, of the immigrants from this political ad. This 7,000 migrant caravan crossing Mexico, marching toward our border. Dangerous illegal criminals like cop killer Luis Bragamantes don't care about our laws. America cannot allow this invasion. The migrant caravan must be stopped. President Trump and his allies will protect our border and keep our families safe. America's future depends on you. Stop the caravan. Vote Republican. I'm Donald Trump, and I approve this message. There is so much to unpack in this commercial. Number one, the migrant caravan issue. Yes, we talked about that already. But the insinuation that one murderer, again, he's a murderer, who happens to be a person of color, who happens to be Latino. Now, the insinuation that he was a member of the migrant caravans, which is not true. That's the insinuation you get from watching that video. The insinuation that somehow because these are migrant caravans of people of color or brown skin, they are inherently violent is insinuated there. And of course, <clears throat> again, they make no mention of where he was from. Yeah, he, he killed police officers. Okay, he'll go to jail, he'll go to jail for it. Does it have anything to do with the fact that he's Hispanic? No. But that's the insinuation the political ad makes. And then at the very end of it, you see the woman voting. Notice she's Anglo. She's not Hispanic. She's not black. The closest thing that gets to diversity is the fact that she's a woman. But this idea of correlating crime murder to brown skin to the migrant caravans who most of them again am i positive that there are a couple people in the migrant caravans a small percentage that are going to be violent of course there are that's every group but it has nothing to do with the color of their skin the language that they sp speak at home or anything else these are political refugees who are fleeing violence and crime and gang activity and drug activity in Central America that was largely caused, in part at least, by the United States destabilizing the governments for more than a century, who are seeking asylum in the United States in accordance with our asylum immigration laws. You are allowed to come into the United States and declare you're seeking political asylum. Then you'll get a hearing and be determined whether or not you can stay or not. And once again, while the ad is theoretically speaking about migrant caravans, new immigrants, do you really think that's not being applied, the stereotype to anyone of Spanish speaking descent or of Spanish speaking surnames or of Spanish speaking skin color? It puts all Mexicanos and other Latino groups in the crosshairs. So what's next? Well, Mexicano, Latinx, Latinx voting is still a contested field. And as of this recording in 2021, more states are seeking to depress the vote as much as possible, passing voter restriction laws that make it more difficult for urban, lower socioeconomic areas to vote. Only time in our votes will determine the future of the country. There is some positives. I want to leave you on a positive note here. The good news is, is that both African American studies and Mexican American studies have been approved by the Texas legislator and approved for K-12 education in states like Texas. 
What this means, however, though, also is that students can choose to take African American studies and Mexican American studies rather than or as credit for the basic U.S. history courses in places like college. And this is important as a distinction because they are finally recognizing that African American history, Mexican American history, they're not separate. They're not alternatives. No, no. The story of Mexican Americans and African Americans is the story of U.S. history. That's all it is. Which is exactly, if we go back to the very first lecture, what I talked about when I said the Chicano movement when it came to education was not about creating a separate history, but rather being included in U.S. history. This is inclusion. In addition, California, just in 2021, has now made it a requirement, became the first state to require ethnic studies for all high school students for graduation. Again, this will give some hope that students will finally get a chance to learn a more inclusive history that isn't about the rich white dude. Now, of course, as I said, the future of this country is ultimately in all of our hands. We have to fight to vote for what is best for the future of this country. I hope you've enjoyed this class. I hope you've learned something and got something out of it. And as always, until next time, take care and bye-bye.